is so freaking bad. Wrestle Welcome everybody to Juice Pro Wrestling, episode 157, author of author of pain with us is a very special guest he's helped write some great books with many a wwe legends and hall of famers and more uh guys like sabu just incredible kamala uh, tito santana who we've had on the show along with sabu and many more we're gonna dive deep into that world right now he also does some djing on the side and a lot of other cool shit that we're about to find out about ladies and gentlemen boys and ghouls please welcome <laughs> Kenny casanova Kenny Casanova, what's up, brother? Hello. Okay. <laughs> Very nice intro. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> anytime, man. Anytime. How's things going in your neck of the woods? All right. Working on some book projects. Uh, uh, just recently, a couple, I'd say two weeks ago, I got an email from Mick Foley saying... Really? Yeah. <laughs> saying, I'd like you to do ODB's book. And she wasn't really someone I was planning on doing. I didn't really think about it. But if Mick Foley asks you to do Hey, man, if she brings book, that fuck you do that ODB's book. up to your door, why yeah. not? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> man. <laughs> so, uh, so just started doing that. And um, it hasn't really been announced yet. But I'm also doing The Good Brothers in the future. Those, theirs will be out maybe a year from now. Uh, we just, just started to scratch the surface on that one. So it's not unusual for me to do like two at the same time. It happens quite a bit, actually. Um, and it works because a lot of times when you're juggling different performers' schedules, there's periods of times where they can't do stuff. So it seems to work out. So what's like the process of, of writing one of these books with these guys? I mean, are they, are they sitting there basically giving you their life story like I'm I'm sitting here thinking old school recorder and you're listening back and basically making it sound fucking titacular. Right. So, okay. So I was a, a pro wrestling manager and I can fill in a lot of the blanks and put in history and, and, uh, and touch upon stuff that they don't need to tell me about even. And what I'll do is I'll go listen to some shoot interviews, get all the answers for the questions that they've, you know, already been asked a million times before and answered a million times before with a polished answer. And I'll just, copy all that stuff down for myself but i'll ask ridiculous stuff like i'll i'll sit and really dive into stuff that people don't usually ask like uh what's your favorite breakfast cereal what did you do growing up did you go camping what campground did you go to <laughs> like where were you born just crazy stuff like that you know um uh, that they don't usually get into and that's the stuff that really helps me fill out and get that extra material that uh you know isn't covered in um interviews like this and all so um, I think they like going with me too, because uh, having been uh, in the on the independent scene for quite a long time, uh, you know, I'm not just a shirt and tie guy. I can kind of uh, anticipate some of what they would say or how, you know, something should work quite often. Right. So it seems to work out. Yeah. And you were doing the wrestling thing, what, since like the early 90s? You want to yeah. dig yourself a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I'm getting, this used to be a little darker, you know. It's kind of. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it uh, happens. What? Yeah, yeah this used oh, to be God. darker too. So yeah, uh, I mostly managed, did some ring announcing, you know, did some booking, that kind of thing. Uh, the Kenny Casanova character was sort of like a Jimmy Hart meets uh, Tom Jones kind of karaoke gimmick. Uh, which later is funny spawned new. into you mentioned a DJ that spawned into hey we saw you at the wrestling show uh, can you DJ you know can you do a karaoke DJ uh, party for us and I said <laughs> yes. well yeah how much and then it would be like three or four times the amount that the promoter was going to pay me you know um, or you know uh, sometimes the promoters pay you a hot dog and a handshake so you're not making anything <laughs> so oh, the, yeah. the dj there. deal would be like 300 400 500 dollars and then that turned into can you do a wedding and that was like a thousand dollars twelve hundred dollars just started to pull me out of the wrestle a little bit because it was just paid so well but uh the good thing is is that i was able to stay in it and do some of the books so i'm still kicking around that way even i might do a few less saturday wrestling shows because I'm doing a Saturday wedding, but uh, during the week, I'm writing a book with Kamala or what have you, right? So it seems to work out. So uh, I'm glad you brought Kamala up. Um, You know, he's unfortunately not with us anymore. I was a big fan of the dude growing up, and uh, I've heard him on a lot of shows. I think, was he on Austin's podcast or something? And yeah. Dude, he was just, how was he as a human being? Because to me, he just came off as like super humble, super nice, like, and 
just well experienced and wanted to share, you know, that stuff with people, which is weird because I'm, you look at him like growing up watching the guy, he was like an enigma. He showed yeah. up everywhere, but you know, he had Kim Chi by his side and he spoke in native tongue or whatever the fuck he was doing. <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> yeah. So man, uh, I got to play Kim Chi some and that's how I, nice. you know, <laughs> you could, there's a, actually, which is neat uh, before he lost his legs, diabetes, which is the reason why we wrote the book. Mm -hmm. um, there's some pictures of him and I together where I'm holding the kimchi mask off and you can see it's me. I'm one of the few that took that shot with him. So it's pretty cool uh, that I got Killing a little the business. Kamala street. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of Kamala street cred. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyhow, so what happened was, is, um, you know, I played kimchi for him a number of times in uh, the Northeast, heard that he lost both legs to diabetes. And I said, Hey man, why don't we, uh, take, I had a sci-fi book that I was about to put out. I said, why don't we take that? I'll throw it off to the side and I'll start working on, uh, your story and we can use it for, you know, medical ex expenses and stuff. And he said, Kenny, I think that sounds kind of good, but, uh, you know, I want to, I want to have you run by a good friend of mine, uh, well, my financial guy and make sure everything's good on the up and up. And I said, all right. So then he has me call, Coco beware. <laughs> really? So, yeah. I'm, I'm so I Coco call up beware Coco and he's like, oh, Kenny, you got to do him a good job when you're doing the dude. You got to go in there, do everything you can, high energy. But, but remember at the man. same time, <laughs> he's like, remember at the same time that he's somebody's grandfather and he's been screwed over so much in the, in the past. <laughs> do him good. And I said, I right, let him keep all the money. Who cares, man? We're just going to do it as a project for him. So he did the Kickstarter. Like you said, you heard him on Steve Austin and Steve Austin, man, when we got him booked on there, he, he did something like 16, 17 grand the next morning, just like that. And uh, that paid for the, the printing. Um, and I had shopped the book around and some people were looking to, you know, maybe throw three, four, five grand at Kamala for the rights to the book. And I, and I said, I don't know, man. I think he could make a lot more than that and keep it. Yeah, he's, a, so, he's an icon. He's yeah, not just so, one of those characters that you throw away you know he's not the fucking who was that mean goddamn jobber from back in the day big ears mullet uh man, he's you're like, describing all of them right now yeah yeah <laughs> barry barry horowitz there you go yeah uh yeah no um so when i shopped it around uh, i shopped it to triumph ecw press a lot of the the places that do wrestling books yeah. it worked out kind of like this they'd give you two or three grand uh up front and then maybe like a dollar or so royalty or less when it worked out, you had the potential to maybe make five, six, seven grand. That was about it. And I did the math and I said, well, if we're selling these books for like $20 a pop, even if I only sell 2000 of them, you're making somewhere in the area. And if you autograph them between 50 grand and 75 grand. So I didn't like it. So I started learning publishing and I started figuring out, okay, if I go to these people over here, it only cost me two or $3 to print the book. Uh, I need to do this. I have to get the cover done. And I, you know, I, I learned the whole thing. And then we just did it ourselves. We figured out a, a do it yourself, cut out the middleman Punk and rock, brother. treated the, uh, you know, the publishers as like, a, you know, um, an extra expense when I could do it myself. And um, when the book was released, he made 60 grand right off the bat. And oh, I was like, we did it, <laughs> you know, and it still sells a little bit. And we, you know, I throw it to his wife and this and that. Now uh, it's kind of dropped off. That was the first one I did um, seven books ago now or something like that. But um, it did what it was supposed to do. It paid off his, his house and his back taxes and everything. And uh, um, then, you know, other people started coming knocking. So I started doing some other, uh, some other books and it turned me into a writer more than performer or something. I'm behind right. the scenes a little bit now. <laughs> I mean, it's super cool, man, because you're getting the interaction with some of these guys. And, you know, I, I don't know, you know, obviously with you being in the business, I know uh, back in the day, some people, I know some people now they're involved in the business and they give, give me this bullshit. It's like, well, you're in order to be in it, you can't be a fan. I'm like, Dude, that's the dumbest shit I've ever heard. <laughs> you know, like uh, most people in the ones that are successful in professional wrestling are in it because they are fans, you know, even going back to your whole Kogans who were huge fans of, you know, guys, other guys growing up, like it, it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, but you get this to man, I don't even know how to put into words. Like if I was to sit here right now and hang out and yeah, we've had Sabu and, and Tito on the show and it was very cool, but to actually be working with them. And as you're telling us, you know, you got this opportunity to do something now with Mick Foley, who's a New York times bestseller, like, three or four fucking times over you know 
what is the feeling like for you? Is it just a little bit numb? Are you kind of like, just like, Hey man, cool. As so ice? now, now I'm totally desensitized by it. I used to really like be like, like when I first Mark started, out, managing, that's that famous oh, place, yeah. man. Like, yeah. You're when not I going first started managing, like I was working with, with them out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> working with King Kong Bundy and Nikolai Volkov and all of these guys who had just yeah. kind of left WWE and then were hitting the indie scene. Um, and they would be the headliners. And since I was managing, um, they might not want to bump as much because they're a little older. So they'd want the manager on the show. They so I'd get paired with them. So I started working with a lot of these guys. So early on, like I would mark out, oh, you know, Jake, give me the DDT. So Jake, you know, and I'd get the Cobra clutch and I'd get a power bomb from Sid and all this stuff. And uh, then eventually it wasn't as special anymore. You know what I mean? I started to lose a little bit of that. And that's why too, um, this might be a little weird, but I've had this conversation with some, you notice during COVID and before that there started to be a lot of these autograph signings everywhere. Now the now a lot of the wrestlers, they have a whole second career with autograph signings. And I keep saying it's going to kill the town. Like at some point it's got to bottom out, stupid. right? Like it's got to stop. And especially with the, with the virtual stuff, because you would think the whole point to an autograph back in the day would be it proved that you met the person and you were hanging with them. And now to just buy an autograph or whatever seems odd to me. So exactly. I would much rather now be sitting in the fucking studio with you cracking open yeah. oh, it's called Steve hey. Wiser, and go in the town with this fucking thing. Yeah. That's, that's how it is. Yeah, you, you know, know? so uh, Mike Kings, uh, Michael Kingston, who does uh, headlock comics. Awesome dude. Um, he, he said, he said, Kenny, I think the reason is, is you met so many of them now that it's not special to you, but it, it, it's still special to them. Like I, I pose that yep. question, I think out there, like, I don't get why it's special to meet with somebody like this, you know, and I, that's what they say. But I'll tell you when it's outside of my circle, then I kind of get a little bit tongue tied. Like, for instance, uh, I did Beefcake's book. He yeah. had me call Wade Boggs. And I'm like, dude, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that's <fucking awesome. laughs> you know, I'm like, Wade, Bo that's like, Wade Bucker, Boggs. Eddie. You know, so and that's where I started to really feel more like uh, starstruck. If that's what you're asking, you know, do you yeah. get starstruck? You mark out I a do. little bit. You know? Yeah, I do for that kind of stuff. And like they had, um, who had me? Um, uh, Sabu had me call ICP. That was weird, you know, to talk to, to, talk to those guys, you know. Um, so like to talk to people outside of the realm is very odd. Like I met um, uh, Billy, Billy Corian at, at the hall of fame. Uh, nice. He just showed up to the hall of fame when Brutus beefcake was inducted and he's in the back and he was wearing his impact gimmick, which was ridiculous. It was like this pimp outfit with like a fur coat and the rings and all this stuff. <laughs> it's and I saw him. Yeah, man. And like, I'm back there in the big shows next to me. A lot of guys I'd never met before all hanging out. And I'm like, this is pretty cool. You know, yeah, yeah. a lot of these, a lot of these guys didn't do the indies, so I didn't meet him. But the guy that I kept looking over and wanted to talk to was Billy Corgan. Cause it's outside of like my norm, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, that's so kind of where I am. In the world of, of music, man. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I, I'd like to do a book on a, like a, a name rock star or something like that. You know, I think that'd be cool in the future at some point. Who who do you have, uh, speaking of that, who do you have kind of like maybe as a bucket list as far as other than outside professional wrestling? Out wrestling? You know? Oh, geez, I don't know. That's a Probably weird... endless? <laughs> yeah, I don't really know. You know, I actually tried just shooting some uh, random emails and stuff like that, and the only person who bit was uh, the Indian from the village people. So I... <laughs> And that's that's we'll legit. Waiting for that story. Totally legit. <laughs> um, and we didn't really do it. Uh, the guy, um, he wrote his agent or something, wrote me back something like, "Well, we would need a big uh, retainer up front, this and that." I'm like, "Ah, jeez, uh, I, I don't even know this world." So I just, I, I didn't continue. <laughs> I don't even know how I got to that guy. But uh, yeah. who would I like? Um, jeez, I don't, I don't know. Someone like you know who would be a, a neat probably book that's sort of wrestling but not would be david arquette maybe because he's out there doing some wrestling stuff now like he might be a cool dude to, to do yeah. something on you know why he's, not have a book to support the film yeah you know that's that's pretty cool man I, um i met him too and that he was another one of those that was weird like when i met it i was like oh geez this isn't a normal guy i'm talking he's ain't not my he's not my circle so <laughs> yeah. so i was a little starstruck on him too but. Well, I seen a picture. Um, so the year Beefcake went in, that was it. Was that the same year? Was that two thousand five? Same year as Hogan? 
No, so he went in only a couple years ago. They actually had that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. he went in uh I want to say 19 or 18. Maybe it was 18. Um, uh, so the deal with that was funny. Uh just before Beefcake's book came out, he he got onto Twitter and he's hyping it a little bit and he's 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 jazzing up Hogan saying it's gonna be a tell all uh tell all book, brother. And, and Hogan's like, dude, if you tell all when I'm trying to repair my name because of Bubba the Love Sponge and like, you know, dropping end bombs or whatever the hell was going on, he's like, I'm going to sue your ass. So, dude, <laughs> and they, they've been broken up for a while. They weren't really hanging. Um, really? Yeah. So he was he was when he wrote it on the Twitter, he's like, I'll he's like, you better lawyer up like Hogan wrote and they don't mess around like him and Bischoff will sue your ass. So when he, yeah. when they started that, I'm like, Oh shit, I just, the book is coming out in like two weeks. I'm like about and to print just it. Runs it. Out. <laughs> and, and, it, damn it. And, and Hogan's like, I'm going to sue your brother. If you put anything filthy in there about rats, you know, and I'm like, Oh my God. So I actually uh, had to call, I called his lawyer a guy named uh, David Houston like mm-hmm. a few days before it went to print. And I said, dude, let me read you the questionable sections and tell me what you think. And we took the high road to some degree, protected Hogan a little bit in some places. And Houston was like, okay, well, this is fine. I think we'll be all right. And I, we got the blessing. And then after that, uh, Hogan had just jumped kind of back into WWE. And he told Vince, he was like, listen, Br- Brutus is being cool again. Why don't you throw him in the Hall of Fame? So Hogan, I think, and you know, they kind of book, they kind of book the Hall of Fame. It's not really yeah, merit. Yeah, it's they not book a, yeah. it like a show. Everybody watching and listen knows. Yeah, you know, all so Hogan pulled him in. I'm almost positive that that's how it worked from what I understand. He pulled him into the Hall of Fame, got him a spot on there, which would eventually probably happen anyhow, but he yeah, made yeah. it happen quicker. And um, Beefcake even said to me, uh, or said on the mic, he was like, thanks, Kenny, for w- w- helping me with the book. So I took that little, that little loop of him saying that, and I isolated it for 10 minutes and – looped it on youtube so you can check that out if you want to see something <laughs> so it says like beefcake thanks kenny for uh nine hours in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> i like that man what's uh who, who's been your favorite uh guy to work with uh book or like wrestling or book. What I mean? uh, in the book world because i'm intrigued by this whole process because a lot of these guys i mean as we all know they're fucking characters are just like huge and yeah sometimes some of these guys egos as well i'm not insinuating because i don't know it wasn't there but we all know what wrestling is yeah. um so i could only imagine like maybe has there been a time let me ask you this and you don't have to shoot anybody i ain't fucking fishing i ain't asking for that <laughs> but, uh has there been a time where you were working with someone you don't have to say any names we're just like man you know what the fuck what, what's going on i don't i don't know man uh uh <laughs> I'm throwing you symbols here. Vader yeah. was tough oh, to I work know. with. <laughs> Vader was tough to work with. Um, a couple of reasons, though. One, he is stubborn and he has his mindset on how he wants stuff to work, and that's how it is. Um, but two years in, after we were all done, he got a death sentence, dude. He got yes. he got a two year to live uh, diagnosis because of congestive heart failure. Right. So we both agreed at this point. Well, there are some places in the book that if you pass are you going to be okay with shitting on somebody as you did and he only did it in a few places that it was um you know it could be something that would haunt him to some degree you know if he's on his deathbed thinking i never fixed this with somebody so there's a few places that this could be your opportunity to take the high road same as beefcake did and ended up going to the hall of fame over it Uh, (laughs) and he repaired his friendship with hogan they became friends again after that um, so the book actually brought them together. Uh, I said this to Vader. Um, he wanted to fix the Paul Orndorff flip-flop section. He wanted to fix some stuff uh, with Michaels. So we kind of had to rewrite some stuff. Mm. Um, same stories, but he just didn't maybe call them a name here or there or shit on them the same way. you know. So we kind of went back to the drawing table, and it took four years for the book to come out and set it too. But I think it did. A, it came out really good. That's one of my more favorite books. Like it's pretty polished. I I think uh, it's got a lot of his career in there. It's pretty good. I think the same with Sabu. Like his is very thorough. Um, but as far as favorite books, I think I'll loop back to what you said originally. Um, 
probably more of one of my sleeper books. Uh, do you remember Dangerous Danny Davis? Yes, the ref. referee. He was yeah. awesome. The evil ref, man. Yeah. Well, he didn't want to put a real wrestling book out. He wanted to do more of an inspirational type book for high school kids is what we decided to do. Okay. He, he wanted to uh, talk about how he was a bad kid and how wrestling helped his work ethic and um, led him uh, from a bad life to a better life. And then he had to know when to stop, quit wrestling, and then uh, take over, you know, family responsibility type stuff um, and go back to his family. Because that's a big theme with the wrestlers is quite often they're married to the business more so than they are somebody and their family. And they lose like, you know, a lot of uh, kids' childhood and stuff like this if they have kids, um, you know, because of the business. So uh, it tells that story. It's a shorter book um easier read for kids but it has a definite clear story arc uh, kind of like a hero's quest kind of story story arc so i wrote it more like a novel than a, a, like a memoir or an autobiography there's a clear uh beginning and a rise to a climax and then a finale and uh, uh a good message with the book so that's my more favorite one i'm also an english teacher by the way so being able to plug in everything i learned about literature into uh, a story based on a wrestler's life um was what that book embodied so well yeah that's why you got everybody going to you man they're like hit the teacher up it makes us look great <laughs> <laughs> nice and shiny and shit <laughs> dude uh, so are a lot of these guys what was the what'd you say the first book you did was so I did Kamala and then I did Danny Davis and beefcake at the same time. Uh, then I did Vader and, uh, Sabu at the same time. Uh, then Tito Santana. I'm just wrapping just incredible now. Uh, moving on to ODB and I've got half of Bruce Pritchard's recent written and, uh, the good brothers in the future. Um, it's only 10 pages or so written of that. That's going to be a tag team book. I haven't written one like that. Uh, yet i think the idea is we're going to alternate chapters and change the font so you can see who's talking so that'd be cool Make yeah it like something different it might be fun book. yeah <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah and i got a couple things i'm kind of behind the scenes helping with like so we got a mr hughes in the work we got a ken batera nice book in the work uh in the works and a shavo classic which is written it's just a matter of kind of putting it together really uh, yeah, just before he passed, he wrote one with a guy named Kirk uh, Bushner, mm -hmm. and, and uh, he just didn't get it out. And um, I'm showing him kind of the, the publishing way to make money where you can make money and not hand it off to a middleman, the whole formula that works for me. Uh, a guy named Robert Friedman, I'm not going to bore you with literature stuff, but he wrote a book called uh, The World is Flat. And it's he's not a flat earther or something like that, mm -hmm. but uh, <laughs> it's the idea that like if you know what you're doing and you have a website and you can use, uh, you know, like Amazon and different things, uh, different um, websites uh, and uh, e-commerce, um, you could compete with big stores like Walmart and Barnes and Nobles and stuff uh, if you know how to reach an audience and you can sell more of a particular product than they could. Um, and, and, you know, using some of those kind of little formulas, um, I challenge anybody to, to do it themselves and not turn the rights over to somebody of their artwork. I would say the same thing with music, probably, you know, um, while a big label could probably get you out there and put stuff, you know, um, in places where you'd never go. Uh, there are some people that, you know, say that that's not the way to go because they keep all of your money and you just yeah. work your ass off and never get any. You get a, <laughs> so, yeah, you get a small percentage and right. they get the rights and they can keep pumping out, you know, right. different versions, variants of vinyl and, and merch yep. and you don't get shit. Yeah, I think I heard an interview with uh, Dixie Chicks, right? And something like they don't own anything and like they're just finally getting out of their contract now and they're going to put they're going to do it where they're publishing their own music and the whole deal and they're going to own the rights to everything. But like, I don't know how long those, those they've been in the business, but probably like what, 15, 20 years or something like that. If Sony oh, yeah. just taking all their money, <laughs> you yeah. know, that sucks. Well, and so. you get bands like Metallica much the yeah. same. It hasn't really been that long that they've had the rights to all their albums, you know? Yeah. I mean, they were on Electra and I think the first album, Kill Them All was Megaforce. Um, hmm. 
So to finally get all that, which dude, they can re-release that, throw yeah. maybe a couple extras or remaster it. It's gonna sell. They're gonna yeah. make money hand over fist because of who they are now. Yep. You know, didn't Prince like redo a whole album? Like he did every note per note, and like just did the whole music all over so he could take it away from uh, uh, whatever people own the rights to his album or something so he could own like it, probably so. warner brothers or something i think something he might like that on. there is something he got screwed on he said you know what i'll just re-record everything and every you know note per note per voice everything the lyrics and everything and uh he redid it all and released it and he owned the rights to it again or something. I, think, yeah. I think that's why he called himself artist formerly known as prince might too, be right so yeah because they, they, they had his name yeah yeah He's, that's when they, they wrote were, pussy control <laughs> they were like the Vince McMahon of music, right? He couldn't call himself. <laughs> he couldn't call himself Prince. So, yeah, I don't remember that story, but that sounds just like something he would do. Yeah. And, uh, so, how is it though? I mean, with uh, writing these books and stuff. I mean, obviously, these guys. I don't want to go too deep into your business. You know, spill your fucking beans or anything. But, I mean. Maybe give me like a little thing. Say you're working with Kamala. He made a, a decent coin off of that. Is that you? Just like in that particular situation because of his, the severity of his situation with his legs and everything, were you maybe more apt to like cut yourself a little less percentage of the, Oh, of I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. So each one is kind of different. Um, like I'm doing coloring books too. So we nice. just, uh, are you doing that did, Sabu one? Yeah, we did uh Sabu versus the three little pigs. Yeah. With the super genie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I've got Cactus Jack and the Beanstalk uh, <laughs> demolition uh, on Mars. Um, so all of them are kind of like uh, fairy tales or like, um, you know, kind of like a kid's story, but with the wrestlers in the main role. So like um, uh, Cactus Jack and the Beanstalk, it's it's Jack and the Beanstalk, but it's Cactus Jack playing the role. So when he goes up the Beanstalk, you know, with the whole um, – the whole deal he gets up to the top there's a giant there to fight him that giant's vader instead because they had a like wcw ball yeah. you know <laughs> so, here, damn it <laughs> yeah originally it's funny that that coloring book uh was going to be hack and the beanstalk it was gonna be hacksaw jim doug and it was gonna be andre the giant at the top um nice. but uh last minute he was concerned about a legends deal was worried about something so it didn't and we just switched to cactus and i i like it i think it came out really good um so but i mean every deal is different um uh, like for that, the artist spends hours and hours and hours working on the book. And it took me maybe two or three hours to write it, you know? So gotcha. now that the book is finally, I think, paid off the print run, any money that comes down, I'm going to give it to him. So the money that came first was just to pay for the print run. And it's just about paid off. So, uh, and then Cactus Jack uh, can take the book, print as many of them up that he wants to. Um, they bring them to appearances. That's basically what we made the coloring book for. They're more of an appearance merchandise thing. Right, and, right. Uh, Which the is first awesome. guy, yeah. So the first guy is really taking advantage of that at the moment because cactuses came out when COVID happened. So there weren't appearances. But mm -hmm. um, the Demolition on Mars is a spoof of the old sci fi comics. And it's got Demolition go up to the, you know, to Mars and they're fighting um a bunch of clones who look like superfly snooka who know kung fu and they're zombies <laughs> at the same time <laughs> so like it's all yeah it's like a million of the uh sci-fi gimmicks all wrapped up into one um so he can order as many of them as he wants at cost you know he's a he's a part owner with the thing with us if right. he wants to order hundreds of them we say go ahead here's the printer and he prints them up um mm. and that's the good thing because a printer would not allow you to buy something at their cost. For right. instance, Hacksaw Jim Duggan has a book with um, Triumph Publishing. They're a, mostly baseball publishers. But uh, what what they do is if he wants to buy some books to sell on his merch table, they sell it to him at wholesale, same as they would sell it to Barnes & Nobles or whoever. But that's like $12 okay. a book wholesale, and they sell for $25. That book, I could get that printed for buck seventy five to two fifty, probably. So you can see that more – about ten dollars a book is going to the publisher in profit um as far as i mean i know they got overhead in this and that but as far as just looking at what it costs to print the thing they're making it ten dollars on top of every book so in this case um these guys can order as many books as they want sell them bring them to the appearances i also set up a website for them uh, a lot of their books are uh sold autographed because there's tons of collectors out there yeah. So I, you know, I set up TitoSantana.com, BrutusBeefcake.com, and 
uh, you know, I get these websites, KamalaSpeaks.com, set them up with a whole shop. And now they get all of the autograph book sales um, and they uh, get to sell merch eight by tens and stuff like this, you know, and uh, I pay some of them royalties, you know, so it, it, it depends. The deals are different everywhere. Um, but uh, I'm not a publisher. <laughs> I'm not really right. a shirt and tie and I'm giving them ownership to the stuff. So uh, I think they make out much better this way that they're owners of their own stuff, you know? So. Yeah. And word gets out and everybody else is that's cause that kind of been like the trickle down effect, you know, people that have been doing this. And I mean, other yeah. than you obviously maybe hitting someone up that you want to write a book for. Yeah. I mean, like that was, I just mentioned to Vader. I said, you know, you can do it through a publisher or you can, we can do it ourselves and you know, we'll figure it out. <laughs> You'll make more make though. more money. So um, that's why it went me, I think, you know, so. Well, that's pretty cool. I mean, and you got to tell his story and, you know, unfortunately at the time, you know, that it drops essentially it's, you know, yeah. he's, he's passed on. And yeah. So um, I don't know if you're familiar with Jesse White stepped in. That's his son. His son wrestled yeah. some in NXT. Um, he did some stuff in over in Japan with him. Uh, he's actually a good worker. He just messed his knee up. He had done some football and screwed his knee up almost a lot like his dad. Uh, so he wasn't able to work a whole lot later on. Um, but he jumped in. Um, we just kind of, I just treated him like his dad and we, you know, he got half the books. I got half the books and we started selling them and uh, we co-promote him. We went and did WrestleCon together and, um, uh, you know, he, he got a deal now where it's getting translated over in Japan to Japanese. So now one of my books is going to be in Japanese, which that's means super it's, cool. It's going to go like that and open like, this, right. you yeah, know, like and, the manga you read yeah. it backwards, right? Yeah. man. so it'll be pretty neat to see. Uh, it's got a different cover in the whole thing, you know? So, um, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool, man. Um, and it's really neat again, to take control of your own artistry, yes. you know what I mean? Create art and you don't have to worry about someone else telling you how to do it. Um, I can write a book, 400 pages if i want not have a publisher tell me i have to cut 75 pages after it's written you know mm -hmm. or what have you um maybe the same you might have heard with howard stern liked it when he was able to go to sirius and kind of run his own show right, and right. kind of be the you know the master of his own domain um because he can uh run an hour later or half an hour less or something every day whatever he wants you know say whatever um, the hell he same wants thing yeah so Hey, you ever had any crazy wild announcements with any of these guys that you're writing a book with? Like, not really. No, I, you know, I got worried a couple times that Vader's book wasn't going to happen. Uh, as he would say, to even himself, he would go dark. You know, right. Kind of like a, you know, <laughs> he would he would go dark. Uh, he would disappear for three or four months, and I'd start shooting him some messages. Dude, are we still working on this thing? And I get paranoid because I wanted it to come out. Actually, I started Vader's book we in the tail end of Kamala's book. So I had two other books come out before I finished his, like his took a long time. Um, so I would get paranoid. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. And, um, but he kept telling me if I go dark, he's like, it's not, it doesn't mean Kenny, I'm not going to do the book. He's like, just don't worry about it for a while. I'll come back. I'll come back to it. I'm like, all right. So, and he did. So we got it done. It just took a while. Uh, but no uh, arguments, nothing really. No, uh, I'm pretty well, I mean, like, back. Not really arguments, but like, I mean, because obviously you've hung out with some of these guys, right? This hasn't yep. all been, you know, via pan during the pandemic. And right, shit. right. Um, so you've gotten to spend some time with some of these guys. And, you know, I mean, a lot of wrestlers are known for you maybe partaking in this or that. And oh, yeah, that's what I mean by like get, having any like wild and outs with these guys. Like ever just it was just like one night me and Sabu were out and he was fucking getting ripped. And we had we partied <laughs> up, enjoyed life, essentially. <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, I, more so when I wasn't doing the book, I would say more so I would hang out with more of the guys and do stuff um, than during book time, it seems like that. Because a lot of the book stuff is mostly me talking to a guy uh, in a different time zone, like I am right now. Like, we're not really, right. yet, you know, Sid wanted me to come. Oh, I almost did Sid's book. Sid wanted me to come out to his um, his farm. Like, he's got a like a big ranch type farm and uh, i was going to do that there probably would be more opportunity for you know shenanigans <laughs> um during the book if if i had done something like that sid's book it was a funny story too another guy had written his book but sid didn't like it and there were a lot of 
uh, areas that Sid said were embellished that shouldn't have been. So um, he kind of fired his writer, wanted me to do it. And then the other guy took all those notes and put the book out anyhow. And then there was a legal thing. And what happened from there was I became hesitant to write anything because if, uh, deal with the if bullshit. Sid's, yeah, if Sid's su- suing this guy because he put a book out and he did, he put a cease and desist on the book. Um, I was worried that this guy would sue me and or Sid if I put a book out that had some stories in it that were hand selected um, that were also in the first book. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. If, if the guy decided to go it's with this little buddy. story, I'm <laughs> plagiarizing, you know, even though it is Sid's important story, maybe uh, Sid uh, with the, the scissors issue with Arn Anderson, the other yeah, first yeah, guy yeah. could say, well, I put that in my book and now you copied that idea. You used it in your book, you know? So I was like, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's not worth getting sued over. So I don't know what's going on with that. Honestly, right now. Um, it's, it's hard to know, brother. We've had yeah. interactions with uh, both parties. On, on oh, you know what I'm talking about? Oh you, yeah. You heard you know these stories. Oh, okay. I exactly. thought I was telling you it firsthand, uh, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sid was, and he was he was super hard. We had him on the show. There is an unreleased episode. Oh, that it'll never come out because the the audio was so bad, man. Oh, like okay. talking on a cell phone, and it's just yeah. like it was cutting in and out, yeah. and it was just really bad. But then after that, like I was in the studio, threatening leaves. I continued to talk to Sid for like five fucking hours. Wow. Okay. You know, just hanging out in the studio, and I'm drinking. He's a good beers. dude. He'll talk to you. He's, he was nice to me, man. I kind of wanted to do it. Yeah. One thing, though, is he's very particular. So, again, that book would have been a uh, a beast to write, the same as the Vader book. It would have been some years to get it how he wanted it. Oh, yeah. Um, so I was a little hesitant on that, but I was more hesitant on legal issues. You know what I mean? So because of maybe my hesitancy or trying to figure out how we're going to do this, make it all work, um, that kind of made us kind of drift a little apart. And then just the project just didn't happen with me unfortunately so and and it's nothing personal just um uh, more so if you start threatening people law you know a a writer's not going to be able to be in a creative mindset you know uh i'm going to be worried oh uh, you know uh, am i going to am I going to get a lawsuit from this guy over here? <laughs> you know, it doesn't want me to write the book. So right. uh, it's not good. So hopefully they'll get that resolved. I said, man, they should fix it up. They can give me the book and I'll edit it and then I'll publish it for him. And then everything will be cool. I mean, that's what I'd like to be the mediator and just fix it for those guys. Yeah. You know? Everybody worked together. Cause but, that was kind of a shit show situation. Yeah, like that. man. That's funny that you knew it all. You heard some of it though. Uh, oh yeah. Actually what happened is like I was saying, Amazon can be an awesome tool for a writer. They could go on there. Amazon can print one book in mm-hmm. Australia and mail it to a customer and you don't have to even be involved. They can print the whole entire thing digitally from files you put on the cloud mail it out for you for three bucks so i don't have to mail it in an envelope for twenty dollars to this guy in australia you know so um this other guy did some of that type of stuff he did a kind of like print on demand kind of uh and made the book just come out you know <laughs> fast and sid was like we we didn't have the deal we're, no we're done you know <laughs> so uh um I, I think it's still in the court or something i don't know what's going on with it now to be honest with you um, I got a copy of it though. <laughs> <laughs> Do you really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I said, I got a copy. Yeah, man, because it came up and I said, I need to own that book if I'm going to write it. Because if I don't own it and I write the book, I need to know what he what? wrote. So I'm not copying him. So I exactly. bought it. So I have a copy of a book that doesn't even exist. It's, you know, <laughs> there's probably like 10 copies of them out there or something. <laughs> right. Hey, one day it'll be a super rare collectible. Yeah. <laughs> Throw that shit on eBay, get sued yeah. then 10 years from now. <laughs> we still give yes. a damn about it. Have you uh I want to get into some of your like your DJ? What kind of music is share you into, man? Well, well, so since I'm a wedding DJ, I don't really play stuff I like. I'm not really like your um, you know, uh like a Vici type DJ or something. Mm-hmm. Um I do events. So, and that's right. where the money like is. Like some BGs, some Vandy. yeah. Like, so if I went to a, like a, um, a club or a bar, they'll pay a hundred dollars up to maybe 200 if you're a no name, you know, just a local guy. 
but I can, during the same amount of time that I would appear at one of these clubs or something to a wedding for 15 times the amount. So I kind of learned where the money is and I'm a sellout. Like I, I have a few <laughs> tracks. I, I can be creative. Uh, uh, I understand music. I took piano lessons and, uh, I can play a little guitar. Like I, I am kind of musical. Um, but man, when I learned, you know, how to do the, the DJ stuff, um, that's the way that I went. And, um, being a, an English teacher, it's really cool because during the, uh, the summer you have no school. And that's when all the weddings and all of like yeah. uh, the, the, the events happen. So I just shift out of that and then go into full force there. So it's almost like I have two full-time jobs because most of these wedding DJs and stuff will make all of their money from like May to September. And, um, uh, they'll, you know, you, you can make like twelve, thirteen hundred dollars or more. Some people make $2,000 for an event. Um, and you have X, so you only have this right? many weeks that you can do it. So they crank it up. So I almost can make, um, a full career teaching, um, and make the same amount of money or if not more DJing. So it's almost like working two full-time jobs, but just work regular hours throughout the year. So it's pretty cool. Oh yeah. And you're having fun doing it, right? Yeah, man. And I'm creative. Like I figure out ways to like put things together, you know, uh, blend two songs, do something funny in the middle of a song or what have you, you know, that keeps people going as I, I always look for the funny and stuff. Like I do the same thing with the books. I try to make them interesting and fun and, uh, you know, do goofy stuff. So. Well, that's a yeah. dude. I'm looking forward to you talk about doing the, uh, good brothers book, man. Those guys yeah. are fucking ridiculous that's like right yeah. on my alley's like sense of humor <laughs> we got, i gotta figure out too how to we, we've been talking about that because I, there's a balance with it too because if i make the if i make the book in the voice of the their uh uh talking shop show right right shop, yeah um the you couldn't really read it it would just be nonsense you know what i mean and i so i put <laughs> i i wrote 10 pages dick talk <laughs> yeah i uh i did i did uh 10 pages early of like uh luke gallows him growing up as a kid and stuff and uh he, talking about backyard wrestling and everything but i tried to put it in his carny voice you know like oh we baby faced my neighbor and stuff like that you know and, and all this <laughs> and it was so much that uh him and i both agreed we were like this is just too much. We, we got, we have to f actually find the happy medium where mm -hmm. there's almost like, we're going to pull the curtain aside. And you're actually going to see how smart he is. Like Luke Gallows is like, um, he's a, he's a wrestling promoter. He can do every, he's like really smart. So some of this goofy nonsense that you see is really a written character and the uh, creativity behind the force of that, is something that some people don't know. So I think that's what will actually drive the book. We're thinking of doing two books too. Um, we haven't even really said this out loud, so it's not really announced. So shh, don't tell anybody, but uh, <laughs> uh, we're going to do uh, up to, up to WWE book and then a WWE book and thereafter. So nice. it'll probably be two books. Yeah. It makes sense, man. You know, tag yeah. team, you got to have it in twos. I, I like it. And like yeah. I said, I, I think the dude's, a uh, fucking genius as well everything that they've done um yeah. marketing wise you know i've seen like the action figures you know the alcohol the their show it's it's so entertaining yeah they had those spoof pay-per-views that were just like supposed to be bad you know but because they understand everybody there's an audience shit about them. yeah <laughs> you yeah, know like, was... this is the worst piece of shit of it and and some yeah. big names because dude yeah basically they got you know they're buddies with a lot of the big yep. names in the industry man so it's yeah. pretty cool I can't watch this piece of trash. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I thought that I thought that shit was funny. Um, what was the last one they did? What I'm trying to think of the like Jason character that uh that Gallows did and Effie was on it. <laughs> <laughs> he's like he's trying to torture Effie and he's like whipping him with his whip, but Effie's just like, Oh yeah, daddy, <laughs> like getting super into it. He's like, what the fuck? That's just the little little things like that that rock my <laughs> world entertain me yeah <laughs> um real quick as we wind down here kenny i want to know what uh is this something that you want to keep continuing doing i mean do you ever get tired of like the book process is this some i mean obviously yeah, I we're quit all the time and then like right out and i start doing it again i don't know <laughs> I don't, it's almost like the wrestling like none of the guys ever really quit they retire and then they come back and then Terry Funk retires 10 times and then God, he comes back. Man, I think you're being a <laughs> yeah. little too nice on that. <laughs> <It's more like laughs> 50. <laughs> but, yeah. 
you know, but it, uh, the book writing thing is in me uh, as, as is the wrestling and the performing. And um, I see elements of wrestling happen in my DJing. Like when I do the wedding um, introduction, it's not just, and now here's your bride and groom, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Yay. I mean, I do the, f- like the fink. I was going to say, you're <laughs> queuing up the drink, brother. Like, Come down down the oil. <laughs> just like that. Yeah, it sounds just like that. I mean, it's, it's funny. So, um, but yeah, wrestling taught me a lot of stuff. I mean, it kind of, you know, taught me storytelling and it, it taught me, exactly. uh, you know, emotional roller coaster and trying to hit all the different bases and, and, you know, keep the mainstream happy. Uh, a lot of stuff. I learned a lot of stuff from that and, uh, as did teaching. So, um, kind of a weird bag of skills I have, I guess now, <laughs> and uh, I don't really want to give any of them up anytime soon. It seems so. so. That's good. It means you love it, man. You're enjoying yeah. it. You're passionate about it. Like you said, uh, you got to be a fan to do this stuff. And uh, I think you got to be I gotta, a mark. People, I yeah, hate gotta, like how everybody makes like, I mean, I guess I get it. There's some bad marking out. You could do or whatever, but dude, yeah. we're all marks for what we love, you know? Yeah. Come on. You just got to be a mark with some kind of manners. Like if I was around the Hall of Fame walking around with, with a camera and trying to get selfies with every person, they right. would probably threw me out. Um, yeah, yeah. I think uh, Gallows was telling me recently, Mr. Belding from Saved by the Bell. Yeah, is is uh, he is on the uh, no locker room list, or the WWE won't let him in because he marks out so hard that Mr. he's Bell. not allowed in the locker room anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't want to be a Mr. Uh, what's his name, Belding? Uh, Belding. Yeah, yeah, that guy. I don't want to be a him. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's the same thing out. I try to do, man. It's. And we go to a lot of shows and events. Um, yeah. Where, you can do it, too. You just got to know where to do it. Like, if you yeah, do it when they're in the spots. back and catering and stuff like that, uh, there's certain areas that should be sacred and, um, you know, not to do it there. And if you, uh, Belding does it, then he gets kicked out. So <laughs> Yeah, then who the fuck am I? I definitely don't. <laughs> Mr. Belding. <am> I? <laughs> my, my. What, uh, what are you watching wrestling-wise? Right now, AEW, I guess. That's like my big thing. Uh, right when it started, I said, okay, you know, um, good point to start. Uh, it's not three hours a night. I know they have more programming now. They have dark and all. I don't really bother with any of that. I just watch the Wednesday show. Right. Um, and, you know, there's stuff in there, be, you know, for me being kind of old school, there are certain spots and certain things I don't like, but I still don't have to follow um, – three four five six seven eight or nine hours of like wwe of programming uh, i just watch a little bit of it and that's it um uh, you know and um it seems like it doesn't t- it's not the same cookie cutter storytelling form that wwe has been for many years where yes uh, i just watch a little raw tonight and uh drew uh Drew Barrymore. Why is that in my head? Drew. <laughs> That's not his name. <laughs> that bottle of lotion behind you too. So, kid. What the fuck? so yeah. So Drew Barrymore <laughs> is in the ring, and then Kofi Kingston comes out, and then uh, 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 Bobby Lashley's in the ring, right? And uh, they're all arguing, and then the is his name Adam Cole. Adam Cole comes to the ring and says, "You know what? I have a bright idea. All three of you guys should fight." And then you know they oh, do Adam the same. Pierce? Adam Pierce, what I say, yeah, Adam, yeah. Adam Pierce comes to the ring and he said, he says, I'm going to make you two guys fight. And then it's going to be for him for the title. Like it's, it's like same bullshit, all same, the time. you know, orchestrated. We start with a promo. We go into a match that these guys are involved with. And then that leads to like the main event. And uh, it's just, you know, I got kind of sick of it. And, uh, oh yeah. It's easy. The COVID I mean, thing really killed me though. Like the no audience. And then I don't even really like Thunderdome. Like it just, to me seems like they're playing a laugh track over TV faces. And it's just too much for me, man. So, yeah. Well, that's I exactly AEW did the right thing. You just revealed, you know, their magic. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> in the business. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you a quick story. And I get a kick out of this. Um, there used to be a, a ring announcer for WWE named Bill Dunn. Um, he was kind of the fill-in for the Fink. This was a mm-hmm. long time ago. This was back early, early 90s, just before I started with Independence. And um, uh, he brought me in the ring for a, a guest ring announcer spot in Albany, New York. And I, I was on Superstars and Challenge and all this thing. And I was, you know, they, once in a while, they bring someone in, they'd have a guest ring announcer. Yeah. So he saw me and I used to kind of like, 
uh, you know, bust his chops. I would have a bill done sign and he's like, I'll find that kid in Albany. He points me. He's like, come over here. I'm going to give you the spot. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> so uh, I go in the ring and I do I, kind of a, a fake impersonation and the King's commentating and laughing about me. And, um, and when I went to watch it on superstars, I'm in the ring commentating and then they show the audience. And I'm also in the audience walking by with my buddy. And I'm like, why why is that so so not only did they do that sound sweetener but they did it with visuals because what would happen is is everyone they'd go okay and five seconds i want everyone to jump out of your seats and go yay you know so five four three two one everyone jumps up and i was walking by as that shot happened and they took that and put it in the middle of my spot so um there was a sweetener within my you know, my uh, we're in two places. <laughs> so I, had two, I was, it doesn't make any sense, but that's he's his I own sweetener. It. Yeah, that was so. You're talking about Kevin Dunn, right? Is that not Kevin Dunn? There was a guy named Bill Dunn. Bill Dunn, um, is what you, you'd okay. have to look back just before Schimmel started. Tony Schimmel, yeah, there was a guy named Bill Dunn, and Tony Schimmel was his uh, his bell ringer, his timekeeper kind of guy. okay. And then he, uh, Bill Dunn left, and then Tony Schimmel took over, so it was like right in that area when Schimmel started up. Uh, there was another guy. Uh, yeah. So that's when I learned, wow, that there's production that I don't quite even understand. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> what's, uh, what's your favorite moment? What do you Jones on like the most out of professional wrestling? What's the one thing that's like, man, right, or like of all time, all time for you personally, for me. Uh, all right. So let's do the fan thing. When I was real young, uh, Barry Dar- uh, Barry Darcy was doing Repo Man. Yeah. And I got a gray jacket and I pimped the jacket out. I pimped ah. that bastard out to look like Repo Man. On the back it said Repo and the whole deal. And like so uh uh you know, I went I went to a live show, I put that on and uh he came to the ring as Repo Man, like, oh, this is awesome. So I got in the chair and I'm like kind of like posing and stuff. And through the whole match, he kept pointing at me, he's like we're getting screwed kid. Like this ref is screwing us. Like, and he kept, he worked me into the show. <laughs> it was awesome. You know? Um, so years later I worked on the, 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 the coloring book with these guys. And I told him that story and he's like, dude, that only happened twice. He's like, uh, it happened once overseas, someone dressed like repo. And he's like, it happened in Albany with you. He's like, so I remember that spot. So it was pretty cool. <laughs> you know? Hell yeah. So that was fun. <laughs> um, I guess the other thing would be, uh, I was on, little corner Saturday night main event when it was Hulk Hogan and junkyard dog with the Haiti kid versus the funk brothers. Wow. Hulk Hogan ripped his shirt off and threw it and I caught the shirt and I still have it. No shit. It's on my wall, (laughs) you know? So, um, that's another good mark out moment that made me collect all kinds of stuff as a kid. When I got that shirt and put it on the wall, I started buying the action figures and everything. So. <laughs> oh yeah. It's never ending, man. It, yeah. It'll drain your pocketbook. If yeah, you're not careful. Careful. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny, I thank you for coming on the show, man. Um, real quick, let everybody know where they can find you at on social media, where they can buy your books at sure. and all that jazz. Okay. So most everything I'm Kenny Casanova. So if you go to Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, just go to Kenny Casanova. You're going to find me. Um, I've always been one to jump and grab my name at every platform when it comes out, uh, even that Trump platform or whatever the heck it was. And went away. what was it? Uh, what was the Trump thing? Uh, it's gone. Uh, I don't even know what it was, but I, I put my name on it, though. Uh, remember the one that they shut down? What was that? Uh, I remember. I just don't remember what it was called. It was very short lived. Yeah, well, I got that, but whatever. <laughs> but yeah, whenever something comes out, I quick grip my grab my name. But right, yeah, right. so check out KennyCasanova.com. Uh, you can find all my stuff there. The book stuff is at WOHW.com. That's the name of the publishing uh, deal with all of our books. WOHW.com is all the books. Hell yeah. Well, Kenny, brother, once again, thank you for coming on the show, man. I really fucking enjoyed your story. We'll have to do this again sometime, man. Cool. Uh, I hope I didn't get too businessy on you guys. Sometimes no, I like I it. I like the business side, dude. Okay. We, we like to take everything, you know. Yeah. Splash it. I didn't really tell a whole lot of stories. I tried to do goofy stories, and I did the Kamala and the and the. Uh, yeah, all right. So you got Kamala and Coco. That's good enough for this time. <laughs> That's good enough for these fucking yokes. Maybe next yeah. time a little more high energy. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, brother. Yeah. 
bring that energy and you motherfuckers need to bring it and buy some books because kenny's fucking off the chain with all these wrestlers and he's got more cool shit coming through the good brothers book i'm super stoked for that so i can't wait when that shit drops everybody thank you for watching listening on any podcasting platform right now if you're on youtube hit like subscribe ring that notification bell hey and real quick kenny what's your youtube my youtube is it just Kenny Casanova? Yeah, I think it is. I think it's Kenny Casanova. Check it out. All right. Yeah, go on YouTube <laughs> and check it out. You were telling us about that loop earlier, and I'm like, motherfucker didn't tell me where I can, you know? Yeah. Check it out. Go to Kenny Casanova page. He'll find Hell it. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that shit. We love you. Thank you for tuning in. As always, please rate and review. If you like it, great. If you don't like it, that's even better. Fucking tell someone how bad we fucking suck. I can give a damn. Kenny, thank you. You're an awesome guest, brother. Until next Thanks. time, wet I'm up, wet I'm up, wet I'm up. <laughs> oh, my God, I'm so wet for Kenny Casanova. He's so great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>